uh, let's start with our consent agenda, which includes the previous minutes and um, a second read on a handful of policies and a first read on some as well. Any discussion or questions from um, folks about the prior minutes uh, and these um, various sets of policies? Um, Lynn, I had a quick question. I know when we did a read of the policy for the class rank valedictorian salutatorian policy and oh, at the SU meeting, Polly had a question around some of this language and I, I, but I couldn't specifically remember what it was and wondered if that got changed between the SU meeting and this read that we're doing today, or if it's still reading the same. It still reads the same for now. We have um, another policy meeting coming up next week. So we'll okay. until then. Okay. All right. No problem. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, so if there's no discussion of prior minutes and policies, um, I would appreciate a motion. And I'll you have all eight members now. Oh, thanks, Morgan. Who, uh, sorry, um, who made the motion? I'll make that motion. Oh, thanks, Kat. Uh, I'll do this by roll. Miranda? Aye. Arlene? Aye. Uh, Aaron? Aye. John? Thumbs up from John. Oh, okay. Lisa? Aye. Emily? Aye. Kat? Aye. And Mary is an aye. Um, Lynn, anything we should be mindful of for the agenda preview and prioritization? Yes, because this is the big budget meeting and um, because Rhoda has already done a spotlight this fall, you're not going to have the Bakersfield spotlight at the, um, uh, well, in the spot that the, that's typically in. Okay. Put that for today. Okay, no problem. Um, all right. And so then moving forward with our recognition of visitors, um, we, Jared is not interested in public comment and Morgan still no one else. No additional people in the Zoom and it doesn't look like there's anybody at uh, the emergency services building. All right. My dog seems to want to have some public comment here. <laughs> um, okay, go lie down, go lie down. Go. All right, um, great, thanks. So no spotlight. And so Morgan, you're front and center then with our big budget discussion. Great, thanks. Um, for starters first, um, I will be sending out your November financial report soon. Um, we're just closing November today. Um, I've not seen um, a draft of the audit yet, which is sort of not surprising. Um, in terms of an update on tuition kids, um, since I sent out that report, we've had a few more tuition bills trickling in, uh, but we're still only at about 242 FTEs of tuition kids, um, and we had budgeted for 268. So I would expect we might see another five or 10 come in, but um, certainly we're gonna be below where we budgeted. Um, that's really just looking at the, the gross numbers of kids. Um, once those come in and we sort out the prior year tuition, I can give you a better picture of um, for that line item, how much actual money we expect to have left over but um, at least so far, it's all good news. And Morgan, as far as that surf, that uh, kind of um, savings then on high school tuition, pro will that be in January then that we'll, we'll look at what we're gonna do with that money and whether we're gonna put some into the you know, capital reserve and also potentially as we've done in the past, use some of it to buy down the tax rate for our taxpayers? Yep, so we will be having that conversation in January. That's actually um, the money left over at the end of this past June. 
that you're right. doing then. This money that um, with the tuition kids coming in now is just money that's going to be sitting in your general fund for this year. And so you do have the option um, if you've got some capital projects or you know more hiring or, or whatever you want to spend within this fiscal year, you can still do that. And then whatever's left over at the end of this year will go into your uh, FY24 budget. Right. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, so in terms of budget development, I'll start with a quick run through of the calendar that I put in your packet last month and this month. Um, today, obviously, is your second board meeting looking at the budget. Um, it is also the day that the tax commissioner drops his yield proposal. Um, the yield is one of the four figures that drive the tax rates um, for homestead home property owners. Um, it's the yield, the equalized pupils, the CLA, and then the budget that you ask the voters to pass. Um, the letter from the commissioner dropped uh, about five minutes before five. And um, the figure that he is proposing for the homestead yield is 13,846, which is significantly higher than um, what we had for uh, this current year, last year when we were budgeting. Um, and so if that holds true through the legislature um, statewide, that should drive down tax rates by about 20 cents. Um, so definitely happy news all around um, for everybody who's tuning into that tonight. Um, I don't really have a handle on why it's such a big move. I've got some theories. Um, and we'll start to discuss that um, as a group with our business managers and with the AOE folks who actually know what's going on behind the curtain. Um, but uh, we know that um, that unless something changes, that's um, a big relief going into budgeting season in terms of um, the other decisions that you have to make. So are there any questions on that? Um, probably all of which I will defer to next month. Okay. Uh, equalized pupil numbers should drop in the next two weeks. Um, generally, we see the first number around December 15th, and then there are several revisions sometimes beyond the point where um, we've warned a budget. But um, once we get to about version two or version three, those numbers are pretty solid and they don't move too much. Um, your enrollment, your October one enrollment is up over last year, which should be a good indicator. Um, those numbers don't necessarily track because equalized pupils are weighted differently. So pre-K kids count less and kids who live in poverty or um, who are on IEPs count more. Um, so we don't know what, um, what impacts those are gonna have, but certainly going into, um, going into budget season and waiting for that equalized pupil number, it's, um, it's great that uh, at least the enrollment is going up. Um, so there'll be more on that in your, um, your January 5th meeting. Uh, at the end of the month, we will get the CLA numbers. Um, they tend to come in a couple of days before the new year. Um, we are sort of anticipating bad news on that because of the way property sales have been going throughout the state. Um, so, you know, as happy as we are about that 20 cent drop with the, um, the yield proposal, uh, we think that it's likely a lot of that will be eaten up by the moves in the CLA. And that, again, is the number that, um, that impacts each town's tax rate differently. Um, so stay tuned on that. Uh, we've got a meeting scheduled for January 5th. Uh, ideally, we would warn the budget then. We have another roughly three weeks that we could warn the budget if, um, if there's some information out there that we don't have yet and we want to, um, to drag our feet on that. My guess is that the big question mark there might still be the SU budget um, because we're a little bit behind on getting some numbers that we really need to, to drill down the SU budget and um, give you an accurate assessment. So the SU board will be kind of making a decision at the end of this month, whether they feel comfortable warning a budget, and then the two district boards will run with that information and decide on, um, on where they wanna go. 
So those are the, the tax rate drivers. Are there any questions on that? And we can certainly come back to any of them as we get into the budget. Morgan, just a quick question. So mm -hmm. um, we won't have finished negotiations um, by the time we're getting into this next, in, you know, into January. And so are you going to just, you're kind of guesstimating based on where we usually tend to land at the, by the end of our negotiations, eh? Exactly. And um, I, I think I'm comfortable with my estimation. Uh, if you want to go into executive at, um, at the end of the board meeting, I'd be willing to share what I'm using there. Um, but obviously we don't want that to get out in advance of negotiating with the teachers. Um, okay. I did kind of mention the figure offline to a couple of folks who've done negotiations in the past uh, with us and people seem to be pretty comfortable with it. Okay. Um, the last date that, um, that you guys need to tune into, uh, three of you specifically, is that board petitions are due by January 24th. Um, for your district, they go to Emily Fecto, who's your district clerk. She's also the Berkshire um, town clerk. Uh, you can also send those directly to me and, and I can get them to Emily. Um, I believe I've sent that out, if not to the full board, at least to the people who I think are up this election. Um, but the seats that, that I believe um, are up are Aaron Paquettes in Bakersfield, Mary Niles in Montgomery. And then because Arlene O'Rourke was um, appointed to fill a vacancy, she would actually need to run this March to fill out the last year of that term. Um, if anybody on that list thinks they're not running or somebody thinks that they are running, um, please reach out and let me know. But I think it's those three that are up. Um, yeah, I think that's right, Morgan. And uh, all right, yeah, I think you're right on that for sure. That's what okay. we talked about last time. Sounds good. So you should be seeing now um, something that looks familiar to most of you. This is the, um, the 10,000 foot view of your general fund budget. Um, so you should see pre-K up at the top, um, a bunch of columns. That fourth one is the proposed budget that we're talking about now. Um, somebody give me a thumbs up that they can actually see that. All right. So I will walk through this um, relatively quickly, mostly pointing to changes in how I'm presenting this over last year. Um, and then we can do a line-by-line -line walkthrough on the details um, or a line-by-line -line walkthrough on the staff if either of those are useful. Um, but your general fund budget um, is split up first by your pre-K section. Um, you'll see a, a big increase in direct instruction for pre-K and then a little increase in terms of pre-K tuition. Uh, the direct instruction increase is in large part due to adding a para and a teacher at the pre-K level in Sheldon. And we talked about that a little bit at the last meeting and, and the needs there. Um, some of the rest of that increase is due to us more accurately um, budgeting where some of your paras are spending their time. So um, uh, part of that is um, sort of offset by moving paras out of different sections of the budget. But, um, but definitely adding two staff district-wide to that is, is a driver there. You'll see that we've zeroed out um, special ed direct instruction in the pre-K section. And then you'll see that later on in the K-12 section. Um, this is our best guess at how we need to budget for the changes coming from Act 173, um, which is that major change to, um, to special ed law. I know that Lynn and um, Jody and Michelle at the SU meetings have talked quite a bit about the, um, the academic changes and implications and, and what it feels like to principals. In terms of the budget changes, um, the big one is that there will no longer be any special ed 
expenses at the district level. And by special ed expenses, I mean expenses that we need to track um, because we're getting some sort of reimbursement on them. So we're having discussions among the principals now around what that means for paraeducators and whether they should all become supervisor union employees. Do they all stay at the district level and we just don't count them at all for special ed? Or is there um, sort of a middle way of handling that? Um, that's something that will be coming to the SU board at some point for a decision, um, possibly in December, although I'm, I'm not confident that we're gonna have all the information we need from AOE um, for that board to make a decision then. Uh, next section starts K-12. Um, secondary tuition is the money that you pay to other schools to educate your ninth through 12th graders. Direct instruction is the amount of money um, that you're spending on your classroom teachers and paraeducators primarily. And you'll see a big increase there. Um, a lot of that is due to moving those special ed paras from down below up to this line. And then as we go through the staff, we can talk about the, the changes to other staff, which are relatively minor. Uh, student support is primarily um, your nurse and guidance. Instructional support would be library, tech, and professional development. District administration is um, the NMV board, as well as some of the costs that we pay for the entire district rather than parting it out to the different schools, um, primarily insurance and legal bills and things like that. School administration is um, roughly your principal's, your four principal's budget. Central services is your supervisory union assessment for um, the superintendent's office, the business office, uh, food services tucked in there as well. Um, that number is a complete placeholder at this point. Um, we will be hopefully drilling down into that at the December SU meeting. Plant is the cost to operate your four buildings. Student transportation is your share of the, the Terracell transportation contract. Um, this at this point is um, a bit of a wild guess as well. There's some big reimbursement numbers that haven't dropped yet from the state. Um, and we've also, those of you on the SU board know, we've um, contracted with um, a company to look at our transportation program as a whole now that we've incorporated Sheldon, now that we've got two um, high schools that are under the same district and we've got an expanding pre-K program and an expanding after school program. So really to look at, is there a way we can save money on some of those routes? And is there a way that we can um, expand equity of access for pre-K and after school, as well as for kids in say Sheldon or Bakersfield who want to attend Richford High School where the busing routes have just never been there before. Uh, the last line in this section is debt service. Um, so that's the bond payments for the four schools and then the insurance payments associated with that. Um, next small section is for summer school. I've just pulled that section out primarily because um, the state in, in their uniform chart of accounts is sort of pushing us to track that a little bit better. Um, my gut tells me that with the ESSER money and the focus on um, catching kids back up that most if not all of any summer school programs that will be running next year will be covered by grants, but I thought it was good to start um, putting some money in the way in this um, should we need it. Um, the after school program is that um, chunk of money that each of the two districts kicks in to support the um, 21C grant and the after school program in, in all of our schools. Next section is special ed. Again, that direct instruction line is going away because we, wherever those pairs end up, um, we are not gonna be counting them as special ed employees at the district level. And then the central services line is the special ed um, assessment that's covering your SPED directors and then all of your special educators in your buildings, as well as all the tuitions and transportation costs for 
special ed kids who are going out of district, and then any NCSS employees that we've hired um, who are working with your kids who are still in district. Um, that's probably the squishiest number in this budget right now. Um, we, we have seen numbers for the new funding formula for Act 173. Um, in our case, the calculation was wrong because they were not taking into account um, the fact that Sheldon was not in our district for two of the years that they're using to, to base their grant and wasn't for one of the years. Um, so the, the AOE is aware of it and they are recalculating that, but um, I have not seen a number and I don't have a real strong guess as to whether that's gonna be an extra quarter million or three quarters of a million coming to us, um, but it should help. The last two sections um, for the elementary schools are both pretty minor, um, athletics and then co-curricular. We're trying to do a better job of, um, of capturing that with the new chart of accounts. So that is the speed walk. Um, I'll throw up next um, pie charts. Everybody see a pie chart now up there? So this is, um, this is a graphic representation of your budget broken up into those big picture categories. Um, you'll see this blue, huge blue section that's 90% of the budget is really what's in the regular ed section of your budget. Um, direct instruction is the lion's share. Um, and then this uh, big piece of pie on the other side, the tuition payments is the other big piece of, um, of your budget. The yellow line is a, a tiny line for after school, green section is a tiny line for special ed. And then there's a couple of slivers that you probably can't even see um, for athletics and co-curricular in summer school. Um, this may or may not be useful to voters, but it's something that we've included in the past. Um, this one I think is a little more useful in terms of representing your budget. And this is looking at, um, at the object codes. So everything in blue is the cost of the people that you hire. So this first section is salaries, the darker blue piece of pie is health insurance, and then the one next to it is all your other um, employee benefits. So half of your budget is spent on people. Um, the yellow section, which is almost the other half, is services. And the big bulk of that is those tuition payments that are um, going out either to your high schools um, or in some cases to um, your Act 166 pre-K kids or with um, private providers or kids who are on a 504 plan and are at an out of district placement but don't qualify for special ed. Um, then up at the top, you get some relatively minor slices of the pie, transportation, other services, your debt, and then this red um, section is all the stuff that you spend money on. So it's your fuel bill, your light bill, buying pencils and paper and crayons. Um, this one, I, to the extent people look at it, I do think it's useful because it kind of helps combat the perception that most of your budget is spent on supplies, which I think is out there and has never really been accurate. Um, any questions on those? I can't see you now, so I'm gonna take silence to mean that there are none. Morgan, I always feel like it's really helpful to see the breakdown by category. Like the, the pie graphs really, I think, represent um, the big picture really well. So I appreciate you taking the time to do those. Yep. And I don't, I don't know of any other way to slice the data that would be helpful, but if folks have other ideas on, on how to do that, um, certainly happy to. Um, up on your screen now is the big document that I sent out. And I guess I'll look for uh, Mary or anyone who wants to weigh in on whether we wanna go into this um, line by line or not, or if you wanna just hop around and ask questions. I will tip, um, so this is version three. If, for those of you who immediately scroll down to the end to look at the increase, um, this version is about a 1.75% increase. Um, obviously, we haven't looked at the revenue piece yet, so we don't um, don't really have a sense on tax rates. 
um, other than the good news that dropped today. I will tell you the things that I am going to be looking at primarily between this version and version three um, is that the, the Healthcare Bargaining Commission, um, the, the arbiters will make their decision, I think sometime in the next week, what the healthcare plans for all school district employees look like um, for the uh, 2023 calendar year. So that'll impact half of this budget year. And so once we get that, I will drill into the to the healthcare lines, the insurance, the HSA, and the HRA. Um, probably won't change too much. Um, and this is always uh, a bit of a wild guess because um, teachers and administrators uh, do get to change plans from time to time. So um, there are moving parts that we can't really budget for. That will be in there. Um, any changes to tuition, I expect that, um, you know, as we see a few more high school tuition bills come in, we will add a few more um, tuition bills for the coming years. I've captured all of your eighth graders as far as I know, unless there's a big change in one of your schools for eighth graders. So I don't think that number will move much. Um, I have asked Melissa Wood to look at the pre-K numbers and see if we need to, to jack those up. Um, We've heard of a relatively large provider who might be hiring a, a licensed teacher for her program. And if that happens, all of your kids who go there will then be eligible to, to take that $3,500 tuition voucher and bring it to that, um, that placement. So that number may pop up a bit um, in the scheme of a you know, multi-million dollar budget, it's probably not gonna be a big move. Um, the two supervisor union assessments that I mentioned, the three, because I would include transportation in there, um, those all have the potential to move pretty significantly. Um, we do know that we've got a lot of teachers who have um, suggested that they're going to make column movements. So I'll be working with Jamie over the next month to make sure that I've captured all of those. Um, I think Lynn's talking about that in her section. Um, I just know that Overall, it's a pretty huge number, um, and I haven't tried capturing those because those the deadline to let us know was today. Uh, the only other thing that's out there that could move would be any um, any high cost kiddos that are not on IEPs. Um, we always have a few in your budget each year, um, so I don't anticipate they're going to move dramatically one way or the other. Um, but that is um, you know a conversation that we have pretty regularly around here until the special ed budget is warned. And, and occasionally we do find some that, um, that we feel are gonna move between now and the next school year. So do folks wanna ask questions or do they want the grueling line by line walkthrough or section by section walkthrough? Morgan, maybe a compromise on not the line by line, but section by section. Sure. I can do that. Um, so up first on your screen is Bakersfield, pre-K, regular instruction. Um, in terms of people, which are the biggest driver, um, and I'll, I'll make these changes or tell you these changes budget to budget, not necessarily who's in the building now compared to budget. Um, a budget to budget, uh, still one teacher, still one paraeducator, no change there. Um, for Bakersfield, K-12, regular education, um, there's a 2.0 drop in terms of teachers. Um, I think they're both to be hired so that we had not filled. Um, and then a, a 2.0 increase to paraeducators budget to budget. So um, that's really capturing people who are in the building now. Page three, um, you'll see, well, at the top of page three, you'll see that we've got a, this would be what it looks like when we have a placement for a kid out of district. And so you'll see that in um, this tuition to private LEAs uh, sprinkled about. In terms of guidance for Bakersfield, we had budgeted for a 1.0 and you had hired for a 0 0.8. So there's a little bit of a drop in terms of FTE there. 
Bakersfield Health, uh, no change. You still have a 1.0 nurse. Your um, professional development for staff, um, there's no staff hired there. So it's just um, kind of a flat amount that we're giving out to the districts um, for, um, for in-service purposes. Library in Bakersfield is uh, no change at 0 0.5 FTE. Your um, technology, again, no change, 0 0.5 FTE. Um, and this is the position that's shared with Montgomery. Um, Office of the Principal, uh, no change to your principal or to um, admin assistant, a 1.0 for both of those. I've got a placeholder for salary here because you're negotiating um, still with Rhoda. In terms of um, operation of buildings, uh, no change proposed in terms of your custodial staff, um, sticking with 1.5 there. Um, there'll be a lot of lines down here, um, which I will try to get back to. These are for your utilities, gas, oil, electric, sewer, plowing, mowing. Um, generally, I will keep them the same unless I look back and I see some reason for a big swing from the past, um, or I know we've got a contracted service where we hadn't in the past or, or something had moved there. Um, coming in on where we page six, a uh, little bits of money for transportation, um, for athletics and co-curricular. Your debt service comes in towards the end of this, um, this section. Again, talked a little bit of money in each school for summer school. This is your, um, your special ed. So you'll see we've zeroed out the budget here, um, but this current year we've got um, significant ex expenses. And next year, those will be moved up to your either to your direct expense or they're gonna be moved over to the SU. Oh. Um, the actual athletics, so money for coaches and refs and athletics stuff, co-curricular money. And then that'll give you the, um, the end number as we've proposed for Bakersfield. Um, Berkshire follows the same way. First pre-K, um, we are, Budgeting, budget to budget, it's a 0.25 para to a 1.0 para. That's really just um, improving our budgeting rather than any additional folks there. Um, and then you don't have any teachers here, but we are, um, you're buying back 0.6 of a teacher who's an SU employee. And this is one of a handful of SU employees who are there because they have a special ed endorsement. So she's actually in your building full time partially special ed, partially regular ed, um, but because of that special ed piece, we have to pay her out of the SU. Uh, end of page seven, um, direct instruction. There's about a 0.2 FTE increase in terms of teachers. It's not a new position. It's more around us um, tightening up some of those part-time people and um, getting a more accurate read on the time that they're spending in the building. Um, and it's about a three quarter uh, of a FTE drop of paraeducator, but that's offset by the three quarter increase up in pre-K. So that's what I meant by just kind of shifting that person around. Page eight guidance for Berkshire, no change. Um, still have a 1.0 health, no change. Still have a 1.0. Library, no change, still have a 0 0.7. Technology, no change. Um, no change really, you just got a half-time person there. Um, we've just tightened up the budget. Um, we had them budgeted for a 1.0 last year. Office of the Principal, no change. Um, still got Lenny and Brandon in that section. Um, Lenny does have a contract, so that won't be changing. In terms of plant, um, page 10, still 2.0 custodians there, um, maybe doing a little bit of tweaking again in, in your utilities, but not anticipating any big changes. Um, debt at the end of this um, 
at this section on page 10, you'll see for now, um, those principal payments for all the districts are gonna remain the same and your interest payments will drift down as you get closer to uh, paying off the loan. Page 11, tucked in a little money for summer school. Again, special ed pairs going away from here. A little bit of money for athletics and co-curricular. Again, kind of a guess given that it's been a while since we've had a normal year in that regard. Uh, and thus ends Berkshire. So for Montgomery, page 12, um, a little bit of change here in your pre-K teachers. Um, Sandy hired a teacher this year. Um, so that's coming in here. Whereas uh, in years past, we had budgeted um, part of a teacher who also had a special ed endorsement. So they were coming in as a um, purchase service from the SU. So basically just a shift upwards of that person. Um, and then in terms of your paraeducator, uh, just doing a better job dialing in the, um, the FTE uh, for that person, similar to what you saw in, in Berkshire. For teachers, it's um, actually a, a 0.5 drop in terms of FTE. Um, Sandy can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I believe you had a full-time interventionist budgeted and the person that we found and Sandy wanted to hire was only available for 0.5. And so um, she's uh, hoping to keep him next year. So we're going with that. In terms of paraeducators, a drop of 1.0, but again, part of that is moving uh, your paraeducator up to pre-K to more accurately reflect where they're spending their time. Uh, guidance um, is a move down to a purchase service from the SU. Um, currently, you are buying a 0.4 of a guidance counselor from us um, who is shared with Richford Elementary. Sandy wanted this to be budgeted at a 1.0 um, for this draft of the budget. So that is an area where, the, where there is an increase. It's likely if that happens, um, you would actually hire someone directly and that money would move up, but because you already had somebody here, it was easier for me to lump them there. So um, in Montgomery, that is that is an increase in guidance. It is sort of offset by the decrease that um, you see in direct instruction. Uh, in health, uh, still keeping a 1.0 nurse um, and Sandy's actually got somebody hired in that position now. Um, so that will, um, will hopefully continue on. Library uh, is still a 0.4 FTE, but again, we had budgeted for you to hire someone directly and it's actually coming in as, um, as a buyback from the SU. Technology still uh, half time. that's the position shared with Bakersfield. Office of the principal, still one principal and one admin assistant. Um, and you are negotiating with Sandy this year. Uh, for operation of plant, still 1.5 custodians in this budget. Um, and then we get into the, the little pots of money for transportation um, outside of to and from, and then the debt service for Montgomery. Page 16, again, a little bit of money for summer school, um, the special ed money going away, a little bit of money for athletics, uh, a little bit of money for co-curricular, um, and then we get to the, the bottom line for Montgomery. Last but not least, we're in Sheldon, and these, um, these lines here are where you're seeing the increase of adding a uh, 1.0 pre-K teacher and adding a 1.0 pre-K paraeducator. Um, we're at, we've actually moved one of the paraeducators up who was officially 100% special ed. And so they're, they're popped up here and that's why this number is going away to zero and this number uh, is increasing more than you would expect there for, um, for a 1.0. 
Um, direct instruction, uh, it looks like in the budget that there's a, a 1.0 increase. It is actually a, a position that we are pulling from the technology section of the budget. Um, Sheldon's always had a 1.0 tech integrationist. Um, when we went into remote learning, he got moved to teach in the virtual academy. Um, he is still kind of a blended position between spending some time actually in front of classes and then spending some of his time actually um, working with teachers to improve their use of technology instruction. Um, so in this budget right now, I've just left him in, in direct instruction and pulled him out of the, the other chunk of the budget. Uh, there is an increase in two paraeducators in Sheldon. Um, and that's about it for that section. Under guidance, uh, still 2.0, no change there. Still 1.0 nurse. Um, uh, still a 1.0 librarian, page uh, 19. We have under technology, you'll see that's where that uh, $48,000 has dropped off significantly. We're still booking some time for some extra hours um, for that person to work over the summer, um, which is traditionally when they've done a lot of the, the catch up work on the um, hardware piece of the technology. Uh, office principal, still one principal, two support staff there. Um, you do have a, a contract with Christy. No other real significant changes. Um, operation of plant, bottom of page 20, still three custodians. Uh, you can see some tweaks here, here and there in terms of utilities and what we've seen in the past. And again, I hope to get back to that before your final. Um, some little pots of money for transportation. And then this is uh, gets you down to the Sheldon bond payment and the interest payment, um, which we've got. This will be the first year that we've actually had a figure, hard figure to budget. Summer school, minor amount in there. Special ed again going away. Small amount of money for athletics, co-curricular. Um, and then we get to the district wide section of the budget. So this uh, 42,000 is the figure currently for those Act 166 payments. So that's the 10 hours a week that you're paying private providers um, to educate your pre-K level kids. These are the figures I have in for high school tuition. Um, all of those are subject to change. My guess is that um, that they're pretty close, but if they drift, they will probably drift upward either as we find a few more kids or if we have um, if we have schools announcing a tuition rate in time, I will use that one rather than I think a 3% increase on what they're charging us this year, which is um, sort of what I got into that with here. Um, you've got some money in here for board professional development as now required by act, uh, whatever. Um, money for note taker. Um, we've got um, your exorbitant board member salaries in there. Um, insurance is likely to go up. Um, I think I have enough money here, but that's the biggest chunk of, of your budget um, in addition to um, legal fees. The SU assessments we talked about in the, the bigger picture budget, um, that number is still pretty fungible. Your plant section was when you had a, uh, an MV level um, facilities manager. Obviously we got rid of that when the SU decided to hire one. So that, um, that expense has gone out of this budget. Um, you've got a couple of transportation assessments which are still likely to move and then your special ed assessment. And so that brings you to the 18094607 number, which is a 1.75% increase. 
um, over the prior year. Um, again, given that uh, salaries are going up, health insurance is going up, um, you've, I think, got a little bit of a benefit in that you're not seeing a huge increase in terms of your overall tuition payments. Um, but I think, uh, you know, if we come in at 2%, that's a very defensible um, increase to take to your voters. Yeah, I think that looks really strong at 1.75% increase. I mean, that's not a large number in my mind. I do have a question about um, the pre-K tuition payments. And I know I had kind of asked you some stuff before, sure. but I, I just don't understand like why, why do we pay, why do we have to pay tuition when each of our schools has a pre-K um, offering? Like in my mind, I'm thinking about like high school, like we have to pay tuition for high school students when your town doesn't have a high school. Is that right? So I'm thinking about pre-K. Why do we have to pay it when every single one of our schools has a pre-K to offer our community? So the short answer probably has a lot to do with relative lobbying strength in Montpelier. Um, but it is something that was, it's not tied to high school tuition. So it did come into being much more recently. Um, I think that, I think it would be great if it was only on a space needed basis, but that's not how the law is written. It was Does written the subsidy go away? Like if you're a family, and I don't know if this is getting way too out there, but like if you're a family with a child who's like, of daycare age, and you can get like a daycare subsidy to go to a daycare slash pre-K, but does that go away if you're now sending them to like a private pre-K? Cause now it's like pre-K money. So I, I don't know the answer to that on the, um, on the daycare subsidy side. I know that on the Act 166 pre-K side, we don't do any sort of means testing. Um, the only thing we look at is that if somebody is getting 20 hours in one of our programs in school and also at, a, at an eligible provider outside of those hours, we wouldn't pay in that case. So if they are in our program, our 10 hours count first. But even if we have space in our program, if they're going to an eligible provider, um, we're gonna pay for that first 10 hours. And do you think that that's the driving factor for parents to send to a private um, slash daycare pre-K? Is that the schedule? is different, you know, they could send them maybe to like a private daycare where they're there all day versus like maybe a shortened day with like the school setting pre-K. I think, it's I a think that is a driver for people who have means to make that a driver. So I think you it's just have such a shame when we have these like awesome programs like right here in our schools and, you know, to hear that there's so many that could be leaving to go to other places, so. Yeah. I think it's logistical, Catherine, in a lot of situations. So if you have a working family that wants their child to have a preschool experience, but they have no way to get from their work in St. Albans to the school three days a week to do the pickup that might be at like 1.30 and they don't have anybody to support them. If they could find a program in St. Albans that would take them full time for childcare, but they offer a certified teacher for pre-K, I think that my instinct is that's the majority of the situations that represents the majority of the situations of people who choose to take their vouchers. I mean, the other thing people choose to do is, you know, you might live in Enosburg, but for pre-K, you don't have to send your, you don't have to send your child to Enosburg. We sometimes see situations where they might say for pre-K, I'd like them to attend Berkshire because they're staying with my grandma. You know, will I go to work and that'd be more convenient. They could do that too. They could also they can also be flexible about which school they choose within the supervisory union. That makes sense. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. And sometimes that decision is because our programs are full. Right. And so they want to they want to access um, another program, but it might be a, one of ours or a public program. Um, Morgan, I had just a quick question. The Montgomery debt service, are we still paying down the expansion on the building? From yeah. 
I think that maybe next year is the last year we see the principal payment. I have to look it up, but I, I think um, I think it started in two started in two thousand three or two thousand four, somewhere in there. So we are getting to the end of it, and that'll be the first one that drops off uh, of this budget. Oh, nice! I figured we must be in the home stretch of that. Yeah. Yeah, and that was a big money at one point, and now it's going to probably be three tuition kids, maybe four tuition kids when we get to that point. But right. we'll take it. We will take it. All right. Well, thanks, Morgan. That was a really, really thorough um, walkthrough. It's very helpful to uh, get such a good sense of the budget. Right. So, um, I mean, I, I did tip you to where I am gonna be going to tweak this budget. Um, the principal's got this version the same time you got it today. And so if there's anything in there um, that I have horribly missed, they will hopefully let me know in the next couple of days and I will own all of those mistakes. But, um, you know, barring any corrections like that and the, um, the changes that I've mentioned to you, uh, at the top of the hour here, um, unless there's a course correction from the board, I think this is getting to be pretty close to what we're going to be bringing to you in January um, at some point to adopt. Great. Thanks, Morgan. And understanding that um, when the um, when the revenue figures come in, um, uh, all bets are off and we might be scrambling to, to do something different. Um, I, I will remind you that you have a significant amount of money um, left over from 2020. The auditors are finalizing that number now, but it's in the, the seven digits, not six digits. Um, and so I think we brought forward maybe 400,000-ish um, to buy down taxes for the budget year we're operating in now. So it will be certainly easy for us to do that again and still put a, a relatively healthy chunk away into a capital reserve fund if your voters give you permission for that. Nice. Um, that's great, Morgan. And Morgan, what's the what are how many students are we graduating in 12th grade? And then how many eighth graders do we have? Do you know? So I do know, well, I look it up. Um, so I think that you've got 65 eighth graders, uh, at least when I counted last, it was 65. And in terms of FTEs that we've seen, we're at about 53 12th graders. Okay. So that's, um, that's part of the reason that you're not seeing a big increase um, in your high school tuition. Um, and again, we may see a you know, some more filtering in. Um, I think I know of one 12th grader that I can name by name whose bill I haven't seen yet. Um, and then we've gotten, um, you know, we have the stray kid at Mississippi Valley and MMU um, and we may see those bills still come in. Okay. All right, anything else, Morgan, budget-wise? Are you, are you all set there? Uh, that's all I'm bringing to you. So unless um, unless you have other questions or um, concerns about the budget, um, and you can certainly bring those and any suggestions on um, on what we pull together to present to voters, uh, you can do that offline. Great, great, thank you. Um, all right, Lynn, you're up with your report. Okay, I think I'm going to be relatively quick today because I had anticipated that budget conversation was going to go a little longer than that. So maybe it will be a short night tonight. Guessing no one would object. Uh, so I'm going to start with personnel. We have some hiring I'm using two screens tonight. So my apologies for not looking at you. Um, in Sheldon, we have hired Courtney Norris as a para educator and Robert Thompson as a custodian. They're both support staff, so we don't need any motion. That's just informational. Uh, in terms of resignations in Sheldon, we have Deanna Simino, a paraeducator who has resigned. 
um, and we have one retirement notification. So today is the deadline for retirement notification. So Jamie and I went over it at the end of the day. I suppose I still could get one, um, you know, before midnight. Uh, but for right now, we have one that we know of in NMV. And that sadly is Lori Boudreau, who is um, a literacy interventionist at, at Sheldon. Wait, math interventionist at Sheldon. Sorry about that. Uh, Lori's been there a really long time. How, how many years, Christy, do you have a sense? Whoops, sorry. I'm going to say uh, 15 or 16. She's she was like, at Highgate before that. I've heard nothing but good things about Lori. So she's, she's really going to be missed at mm -hmm. Sheldon. So for that, we will need a motion from the board to accept her resignation. I'm sorry, her retirement notice. I'll make that motion. Thanks, Lisa. Um, Kat, I. Emily. I. Lisa. I. John. I. Aaron. I. Arlene. I. Miranda. I. And Mary is an I. In terms of open positions, we have a paraeducator position open in Bakersfield. Berkshire Elementary is still looking for a half-time academic coach and a paraeducator, and Sheldon is looking for a paraeducator. In terms of salary advancement, as Morgan indicated before, that was due today, and we're, we have a lot of those notifications. I know that our list is not completely accurate because both Jamie and I have been receiving those. So I'll give you that report in January, but I can tell you just from looking at the list, we have a substantial number um, across the entire SU that our teachers have been doing a lot of professional development, which is a really good thing. Um, and I just lost my screen. I don't have anything under student this evening. And in terms of COVID related updates, I feel like there hasn't, because of the break, there hasn't been a lot of um, time since the last time we met. So I, I've been communicating and CCing you all on that communication. So you're aware that we've had a significant number of cases in F, across FNESU. I have a visual just to kind of spark the conversation that I'm gonna share with you tonight. I mean, I cannot take credit for it. It's Courtney um, who creates these beautiful visuals for me. Can you see my screen in the bar graph? Yes. So what this represents is the start of the school until this last week. And what she's done with this graph is she's given you a color coded representation of the number of cases in each school. So what we've seen in terms of trends since the start of the year is that we will have some schools that will have a lot of cases all at once and it feels like it lasts a few weeks and then those cases will start to diminish and another school will pop up behind it and they'll have a lot of cases. So you could see over the course of the last four weeks that we have been, you know, we've had cases way over 20. Um, actually, they've all been 25 or over the last four weeks and on um, this fifth week, I put a little asterisk here this indicates where we are as of the end of today. So we've already had 27 cases this week. Um, for the first two school years of the pandemic, the high point that we, we ever had um, in terms of number of cases in a week was 19. Um, and that happened in February of 2021. Um, and we closed for that week before the February vacation. So that was when we had 19 in a week. We've had a high point of 43 um, a few weeks ago. That was definitely a rough week, especially in Sheldon. You can see that Sheldon's had kind of a significant number. Um, those cases are starting to come down a little bit in Sheldon. We've also seen big numbers at Richford High School, and those are starting to come down a little bit. Um, and we've seen big numbers at Richford Elementary School starting to reduce a little bit. We'll see what happens this next week. Then when that happened, we saw increases at Enosburg Elementary and uh, Enosburg High School and Enosburg Elementary School as well. We're starting to see more cases pick up at, at Berkshire. So that, that's kind of the, the current reality in terms of where we are with cases. So 
one of the things that um, I will be reporting out on in a future communication is around student vaccination data. So we have had to gather that uh, for a report that we did right before the Thanksgiving break. And what we have found is that our vaccination rates are relatively low in Franklin Northeast. They range from 29% uh, in one of our schools to around 65 in the highest school. So we're, we're well under the 80% threshold in all of our schools. So I think that, you know, from the, what the data indicates is at the state levels around uh, 70 or 80% of the cases they're seeing are in unvaccinated individuals. And when I did the breakdown a few weeks ago, that represents pretty accurately what we're seeing here in FNESU is it is around the 80% threshold in terms of the number of these cases that are in unvaccinated individuals. The good news is, is that there is a shift now, more, more students are eligible for the vaccine. And we did see some, um, some interest from our families and we've had two clinics. At this point, we have two more to go. We had one at Enosburg, one in Richford, and we have uh, one coming up in Berkshire and then Sheldon. And then the second doses will be coming after that. So um, that, that's really where we are in terms of COVID. We really struggling with staffing levels. And that, that's one of the reasons why I decided to close for those three days before the Thanksgiving break. When we see all of these, these cases on the, on the bar graph, those cases represent uh, both students and staff members. So we've had staff members test positive uh, for COVID. We've also had staff members that have had to be out because they were symptomatic. Um, we've had staff members that have had to be out because their kids have been close contact. So they've had to stay home with their own children. So it's, it's a variety of reasons, but I can tell you that the, before the break, um, people in, in school buildings were pretty fatigued because they were, they were wearing a lot of hats to cover all of the open positions that we had, including our principals who've really done a fantastic job of creating coverage where there's really not coverage to be found. So I, I really, I applaud them all for working through these tough times and figuring out how to manage um, during these challenges. So we, we've still got our eye on our staffing levels. It's something that, you know, I've, I've told the principals that went out on their e-blast today to, you know, stay in touch with me as their staffing levels start to they start to really struggle with their staffing levels. And we also have to keep our eye on student attendance. So as we're, as we're um, seeing the numbers of students having to quarantine, if those numbers go up too high, we have to have conversations about whether or not we can operate because we have to have at least 51% of our students in attendance on any given day in order to count it as a school day. So we're watching our staffing levels, we're watching our attendance levels as well. Um, in the days ahead. In terms of tests to stay, we had about, I wanna say seven or eight days of tests to stay before the Thanksgiving break. Maybe it was a little more than that, but it was close. Uh, we had, we were averaging in the end, I think just over a hundred students a day um, and some staff members who were using tests to stay as a tool so that they could still go to school, which was fabulous. We're very excited to see that number of people be able to go to school because they were using uh, that test to stay program. So right now we're not running test to stay because we've just come off the break and we have not identified, you're only eligible for test to stay if you're an identified close contact because of an in-school exposure. So because we hadn't been in school, we don't have the in-school exposures yet. We do have several cases over the last three days that we're watching, we're waiting for tests or several, um, several people who had symptoms and have gone in for testing. So it's likely we'll be running tests to stay. Um, certainly we will need it for Monday. It's still up in the air as to whether or not we'll need it for Friday. But we have um, a fair number of people now who have volunteered to work on the test to stay clinic. So that's exciting for, for those of us that were trying to run it in those first, that first two week period, um, more help is on the way to keep it running, so. That's your update in regard to COVID. Does anyone have any questions? If not, that is all for me tonight, Mary. All right, thanks so much, Lynn, I appreciate it. Um, so we have up um, next our principal reports 
And we have a, a little more spaciousness since we didn't do a spotlight. So certainly um, if any of the principals, I'll go through uh, the different schools here, would like to take a few minutes to highlight something specifically, no pressure and no expectation to do so, but, but do feel welcome. Um, so uh, Bakersfield, Rhoda, uh, anything you'd like to highlight or add from your report or any questions from the board for Rhoda? I will just add that I was a couple minutes late jumping on because there's a roaring basketball game happening down in the gym oh, nice. and uh, they're finishing up the boys, but basketball is well underway and uh, it's good. It's good to see them here. Great. Who are they playing today, Rhoda? Berkshire. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> That's quite the rivalry. <laughs> Excellent. I have a question for Rhoda. Is the basketball schedule on the website for those of us who are no longer in the building? Hmm. It's a good question, Arlene. I'm not sure if it is or not, but I'll check. Great, thanks. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, Lenny, anything that you'd like to highlight or add from your report? Uh, the only thing I, or I could add is that we had made some plans to do some community service projects right before Thanksgiving break. Uh, but then we had to postpone those because we didn't have school those two days before Thanksgiving break. So we're gonna try and um, revamp all of that before uh, winter break. Um, so all those things that we mentioned that we were gonna do, we didn't do before Thanksgiving break, but we're gonna try and do those all before winter break. We did, however, still have some volunteer teachers and volunteer uh, paraeducators and some parents and some students come in on the Monday before break, uh, before Thanksgiving to do the meal prep. And we did make 50 meals. We did deliver those out to those seniors who signed up for it. And we also brought those to some of the other places of business around the our area so that we could still do that piece because we felt, A, we know it was important and B, we had some people that were committed to it or expecting and we definitely didn't want to let them down. So it was really great to have people volunteer and step up for that. And the kids who volunteered, that was really great of them as well. Nice, it's wonderful. Um, all right, thanks so much, Lenny. Uh, Sandy, do you have anything that you'd like to highlight or add um, to your no. report or mm -hmm. any questions for Sandy from the board? On Rhoda, we had our first home game last night and it was it just felt so different having people wandering into the building you know and having people in the stands and clapping and i i just have to say i was nervous because you know the masks and you know all, all of the things that we had to watch out for but everyone was excellent so it was a huge relief and the games were wonderful and we hosted bakersfield and they were very nice rhoda so um and the other thing I do want to say is thank you uh, for supporting us, uh, Rhoda and I, on the whole nurse hiring. Uh, Lara Robtoy started this week, and I sent Lynn a picture yesterday because <laughs> Rachel Hardy is mentoring Lara, and Ashley has been in our school, so she's kind of just showing her some of the ropes and where things are. And yesterday I had three nurses in the building, so I took a picture and sent it to Lynn and said, wow, I didn't anticipate this. So, <laughs> so yeah, that was quite a big change so thank you for that and that's all for me nice that's great sandy i'm really pleased that it's that it's working out and you have the support in uh on the ground there it's great um christy anything that you would like to um highlight or add to your board report oh, i don't think so um No, it's been a bit of a whirlwind. I I almost can't remember the week before Thanksgiving, except that it was very busy. Um, but no, I don't think there's anything to add. That's because of all that hot pink in the graph that I just shared, Christy. Yes, that is probably what it was. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, before you move on, Mary, here's the here's the picture that Sandy was talking about. And it was it was very nice to receive that yesterday. Uh, and I know Sandy had a big sigh of relief to know that now she's got a full-time nurse in the building. And I know so Rhoda's very appreciative as well. 
Excellent. That is great. It's really fun for me to hear the principals talking about the basketball games because we know that this has been a source of stress for for students and for families and for leaders too because last year was so restrictive and we weren't able to have some of our middle school programs so this year it's a big deal and it's exciting and you know we're we're cautiously optimistic we're hopeful that you know we have we have new expectations we have expectations around you know, conduct. We have a VPA statement that we're, we're reading before every game. And we also have expectations around COVID protocols. And we're reading that as part of the statement before every game. So we're, so far I'm hearing from all the principals that the, the fans are being very respectful of that. And I'm, I'm hoping that that will be the case as we move forward, that people will understand whether they agree with masking or not. We want to be able to offer this to the community and to, to the families and in order to be able to do that, we need people to follow what those expectations are. So we thank everybody for it going so well to begin with, and we're hoping we can keep that good positive momentum going. I will say that VPA statement is a VPA book. <laughs> Reading that in front of the crowd was lengthy, and I felt like I was panting by the time I was done <laughs> with my mask and everything. So <laughs> that was quite interesting. It's a full page typed about sportsmanship so oh boy and then you have to kind of read it twice because a whole new set of people come in for the next game oh good we only have six home games i don't have to read it 12 times <laughs> <laughs> i bet the kids are really psyched to be back to playing ball yeah that's that's just great um all right so um, anyone have any future agenda items they know in the moment they'd like to, to speak to? Obviously there's plenty of time to add things as the month progresses. Um, and then as far as the board rep SU board representative report, um, I, I'm happy to share or Kat or Emily, would you all like to highlight anything from the SU meeting? I had to leave early, so I'm a little bit foggy on everything that occurred. I might need help. Yeah, I don't mind, I don't mind doing it. I mean, the big highlights, and I, I think one that really um, is meaningful for us is that, and I don't believe we touched on this at our last NMV meeting, is that we did uh, announced the hiring of, of Vernon Boomhover for our facilities director. Um, so he will be overseeing all the facilities across the SU. He is incredibly qualified. He's a really nice guy. He knows uh, he's a great team player. So I'm sure all of the principals will start, if you haven't already, uh, seeing him in in the in the buildings doing this kind of initial assessment, um, really getting a grasp on, you know, how we're going to map out caring for our grounds and facilities in the short term, the uh, you know, uh, in the immediate, then the near term and the long term. It's a great you know great um, great thing to have him on board. So I'm really happy about that. Um, Mary, can I just say? He was yeah. in my building today and it was great. He, he's, he is a really nice guy and um, he, he was very thorough. He went through everything and he had a really good list of things to talk to me about at the end of the day. And I was just really pleased. And I'll, I'll say the same. I had a Monday and Tuesday and we went through the whole building on Monday and then he came back Tuesday and brought some people for like painting to give me some numbers and all this stuff. So he was quick and he's yeah. very nice. Excellent. Very nice. Oh, I'm happy to hear that. Mary, he's already leaning into the um, lead in the water, the testing pieces. And when there have been elevated levels, he's already he emailed one of these principals tonight and said, I know where there's grant funding to do the replacement on these on these faucets. And he's already off off to the races. Very great. Pleased. I'm not surprised, but I'm, I'm really happy to hear that. That's great. Um, and then I'd say we had two spotlights. Um, Jody and Michelle did a really excellent, almost 18 slides 
of a spotlight on student learning, the whole, the MTSS system, um, you know, looking at how we're identifying children with um, specific learning disabilities. It was really uh, a great overview of the kind of uh, really the important work that they do. Um, and then Jamie did a big HR spotlight and I'm always a little blown away by the complexity of the human resources. I feel as though she's you know, she works quietly kind of <laughs> out of the spotlight in a way. And so it's nice to do an occasional spotlight that really speaks to the unreal amount that she that she manages for the SU in the human resource um, arena, because it is an incredibly complex one. Uh, so um, yeah, my hat always goes off to Jamie and everything she does. Um, and then, Anyone, Kat, I think, I mean, those were the big highlights. We did have quite a lot of public comment, um, people who turned out to, in the public service building and that, that you know, obviously it would be more ideal to all be in person again and hope that we get there. But from a technological standpoint, I, I think that's working decently enough. Um, not ideal, but it, it, is, it is working. Um, and, I think those were the big SU meeting highlights. But I'm, uh, if Emily or Kat or Lynn, if you have anything else, and we started talking about a little bit of budget through with Morgan, but again, it was it was a little early. We'll we'll be deeper in the budget weeds at the next meeting for sure. Um, all right. So if there are no further questions about SU um, report, the SU report, we, wow, gosh, I, time is just flying. So I hope everyone has a lovely holiday season because we're going to be, uh, it'll be 2022 when we gather next. Um, and I don't think, Lynn, I don't think there's anything other I don't, I don't personally feel the need for an executive session as Morgan kind of mentioned. I think that in January we'll be able to, we'll have much firmer numbers around negotiations and where those are heading. Um, but I'm certainly open to it if people feel like they want that discussion um, around you know, where we're gonna be heading with our negotiations with teachers. No. Okay. Mary, right. before we conclude, I just want to say the Morgan talked a little bit about Act 173, and he talked about some of the de decisions we're going to have to be making about how we're funding paraeducators as one piece of it, but also how how um, Act 173 is going to really significantly change how we do business. That it was a big crux of what Jody and Michelle talked about in their spotlight. So. I know it's hard for people to go in and watch board meetings that they don't have to attend, but if you wanted to see just that one portion of last month's FNESU meeting, I think it would be really worth your while. And Act 173 is really complex, and I think that focusing in on some of those slides and those portions might, might help you to understand some of the upcoming conversations we're going to have to have. Yeah, agreed. It definitely is complicated, and there the slide presentation was very helpful and certainly watching that section is a, would be illuminating for trying to kind of wrap our heads around around the complexity of this and how how we kind of respond as an as an SU and as uh, the districts um, anything else folks before we sign off I hope everyone has a really lovely uh, holiday season, stay warm and cozy. And I just need a motion to adjourn then. I'll make that motion. Thanks, Kat. Um, all in favor? I'll go, well, just give me an eye or a thumbs up. All right, folks, stay well. <laughs>